Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're going to fly, we fly like eagles. Arms out wide. If we're going to fear, we fear no evil. We will rise. By your power, we will go. By your spirit, we are bold. If we're going to stand, we stand as giants. If we're going to walk, we walk as lions. Good morning. Good morning. It's Friday. Friday, Friday, Friday. I know. I get kind of excited. Uh, it, it, this is Mornings for Carmen. I'm Carmen LaBerge. It is December the 1st. So if you're going to embark on one of those devotionals that um, that starts on December the 1st instead of starting on the first day of Advent, today's the day you got to start. So, like, you know, dust it off and track it down. I know Advent doesn't actually start till Sunday, but a lot of our Advent devotionals start on December the 1st and track um, to Christmas Eve and Christmas. So... Just a little heads up on that today. Uh, Our Growing Your Faith verse of the day comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I want you to consider who is speaking, to whom the message is being spoken, and what the message is. So where in the word are you this morning? I am in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Um, So who is speaking, to whom is the message being delivered, and what is that message? Okay, well, the first one's going to be super easy because it's given away in the first phrase. So the Lord God said, and then the answer to the second question, to whom is the message delivered, is also given away here in the opening phrase. So the Lord God said to the serpent. All right, so God is speaking, and to whom is God speaking? Directly to the devil. I don't know if you've ever considered that before. Um, as we uh, open the word of God, we ought to pay attention to who is speaking and to whom the message is being delivered. And then what is the message? So again, this is in Genesis chapter three. This is all the way back at the beginning. Now, not the beginning, beginning, not the good old days before the fall, but uh, the days just following the fall. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this. Now, what is the this? that the serpent has done, well, led uh, humanity into temptation and ultimately into sin. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. Now, you and I are saying, well, this is the direct message to the snake. Yes, but the snake is the representation here of the one who led humanity into temptation. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, that would be the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So who is the he to whom the Lord God is referring in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? Who is the offspring of the woman to whom God is referring, that will crush the head of the devil. Even as the enemy of God, Satan, the devil, will strike his heel. All right, so this is God's promise of a Savior. This is the promise of the promised one. God shares here in the very opening chapters of the book of Genesis the seeds of a plan the seeds of the gospel plan, the seeds of God's redemptive plan that he'd already worked out before time began. Now think about this. Before creation, before the fall, God actually knew what would have to be done in order to redeem us. He knew we would need redeeming, and he knew what would have to be done in order to redeem us. And knowing all that, God made us anyway. I got to tell you, that is amazing grace. That is unfailing love. That is the character of God. Verse 15 here of Genesis chapter 3 has been called the pro-evangelium. So the first announcement of the the good news of the gospel, the euangelion, the the gospel, the the good news. This is the pro. 
Evangelium. This is the announcement of, the first announcement of the good news of the gospel, and it comes in Genesis chapter 3. And for centuries, Christians have agreed that this verse establishes that God had a plan for redemption through Jesus Christ from the very beginning. Ephesians 1.4 amplifies that. But because these words are written thousands of years before his death on the cross, there are those who say, well, you know, that's just you reading back into a verse of Scripture, what you want to see. No, mm -mm. they prove to me that the Lord not only wrote every word of Scripture, but had the end in view from the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning and history as it unfolds in the midst of his sovereign eternal plan. That doesn't say that God controls everything, like in terms of like we are puppets. No, no. The freedom of the human will is actually demonstrated in, in the verses that we're reading. You and I absolutely have the freedom of our own will. And God has the freedom of his will. And his will is for salvation. Jesus is the promised one for whom the world waited from the beginning of time. He came uh, in flesh, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He rose again to judge the living and the dead. He's coming again. We have seen his first advent. His name is Jesus. We celebrated at Christmas. And we now await his second advent. He promises that he's coming again. And we now await him with a certain hope. Where in the word are you today? I encourage you to get into the word of God and let the word of God get into you before you get out there into the world that God so loves. Why? Well, because you're going to be greeted today with lots of opportunities to um, either hold your tongue or speak And when you speak, we want you to not only speak truth, but to speak truth in love. So we got to prepare ourselves for that. We've got to apprehend the mind of Christ on the matters of the day so that we can walk our faith out into the world that God so loves and do so in ways that honor Jesus. Yes, in our political speech as well. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about politics for people who hate politics, because that's many of you right? We don't want to talk about politics. We want to put our head in the sand. Yeah, except that we're called to engage as Christians in the reality of the world today and to speak the truth in love in the matters of the day. So Denise Gitsum is going to join us, author of Politics for People Who Hate Politics, How to Engage Without Losing Your Friends or Selling Your Soul. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. If you have become uh, exhausted by the political discourse of the day, in particular how Christians are engaging in political discourse, you are going to absolutely love Denise Grace Gitsum, and you're going to love her new book, Politics for People Who Hate Politics, How to Engage Without Losing Your Friends or Selling Your Soul. Denise, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Good morning, Carmen. I'm so honored to be on your show this morning. Everything you stand for, I just can't stop saying amen to. Well, I've heard you say on air, you know, that we need to to cultivate the ability to speak the truth. And I that is absolutely um, I resonate with that. Uh, and and then you go on to clarify, like, right, we need to be able to speak the truth in love. It matters yeah. how we say what we say. And so we want to be speakers of truth, but we want to do it in a way that honors Jesus. So I, I couldn't be uh, happier to not only to have you here talking with us today, but um, to share with folks Um, what you are saying in politics for people who hate politics. So let's just start there. Like, what motivated you to write this? I suspect that it is you grew weary of watching Christians attack one another in public over political um, conversations. Yes, I did. But actually, I grew weary and it's kind of embarrassed, honestly, and um, remorseful about how I had actually contributed to the division within the body of Christ in America. You know, I have been in politics for over 20 years in my career, and I have done it wrong most of the time. So this book is actually an amalgamation of all the mistakes, not all, just a fraction, actually. I didn't, I don't have enough room to write them all in one book. No one would read them. Um, But, you know, for years, I did politics as usual. 
I did what the mm. world did. I saw what was modeled around me. Instead of being salt and light, I was just just like everybody else. And if you looked at my life, you would see me going to church on Sunday, but I had this weird sacred secular divide where I had church Denise who loved people and blessed them. And then I had, you know, this political Denise that would do anything to cut you down if you were on the wrong side. And so this book is sort of a mea culpa. And it's really, it was born from having to be a candidate myself. In 2016, I ran for Congress in San Diego. And when I established that I was going to run, I made an announcement in front of the media. And I said that I was running on things that I didn't think were that groundbreaking. It was on the basis of civility, honor, and respect. And for some reason, the media picked up on that and couldn't believe that somebody had said that out loud. Well, once I did, it actually helped put guardrails around how I acted in the public because I had established myself as a Christian at the outset, and God was helping me be accountable to what I'd said by making me say it out loud. And so I had these guardrails around my behavior and my actions. People were looking at me and they were judging God based on me if they didn't know him them, Him themselves. And so I just knew that my, my job was to be a witness, to love people well, even in our disagreement. And a lot of these principles came out of having to act them out on my own. Denise, that's so good. I, um, I like you, um, have a history of having done battle in a particular political environment. It was, it happened to be in the context of one of our mainline denominations. So not sort of politics writ large on the public scene, but in a smaller environment. Um, and I arrived at the place where I recognized, you know what, we're doing it wrong. We are, we are fighting the battle in, uh, in the ways of the world. And the pivot for me, the moment of transition for me is actually when God led me to see people differently. I began to actually see the people who were opposing the truth, um, not as my enemies, but as prisoners of a war. Like they were like people in a concentration camp and they had been living, I mean, they were born and raised in it. So they thought that was reality. They thought yeah. that was good. They thought that was beautiful. They thought, and and they couldn't be further from the truth, but they couldn't see themselves, but I could see them in, mm -hmm. you know, in the hands of the enemy. And once that pivot took place for me and I saw them differently, I mean, I, it, it radically changed my approach to the conversation. It radically changed my approach to um, the way in which I believe we have to engage. And that is, you know, as you describe in your book, it is with love. It is if I want to influence somebody, then I have to love them first. Yeah, I think that often people confuse love with sort of being weak or losing or not speaking the truth. It's interesting. You know, one of the things I realized when I was on the campaign trail was that it's it's really impossible to to love without the truth. Like truth, love is not mm -hmm. love without the truth, but it's really easy especially when you're in the hot seat and people are, you know, throwing bombs at you, verbal assaults and other kind of assaults to speak truth without love. And that's why Jesus admonished us to speak the truth in mm -hmm. love. And oftentimes what I heard Christians say when I was on the campaign trail was, well, the truth is love. And I thought to myself, is that true, Lord? And so I took it to him and he said, no, if the truth was love, I wouldn't tell you to speak the truth in love because that would be redundant. And actually Jesus makes a real good point in throughout scripture and everything that he did and dying on the cross for us, that love is loving. And if you've never even cracked open a Bible, you would still know what love is because if you've ever been to a wedding, first Corinthians 13 tells you exactly what love is like. And so I'm I'm just as concerned about um, speaking the truth in love as I am about speaking the truth. And that's what this book is really about. It's about how we show up with the character of Christ that pe that will stick with people so much longer than any political position that you insist on being right about. Yeah, people will remember that you loved them. They will yes. remember that. They may not agree with you, but they right. will respect you. Um, and, and, and you win the right to return to the conversation a second, a third and a fourth time. Um, no question yeah. about it. I bet that's, I bet that's been your experience. It really has. You know, we talk about winning as if this is a blood sport. Politics is a blood sport. <laughs> and what we always forget is we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to shift atmospheres, to change conversations. And the Holy Spirit ultimately is the one that changes people's hearts. But we are empowered with his spirit. Like we have the spirit of God. We have the mind of Christ. And so, you know, we end up having 
it's really a winning strategy to do things God's way and not in spite of what he tells us to do. When we align with him and his will and his way and we're obedient, God desires obedience, not sacrifice. There's only really one big commandment that we have to obey besides loving God, and it's to love your neighbors and your enemies. And so when we are aligned with him, we are naturally empowered to operate in his strength and in his wisdom. And what can stand against that? We're talking with Denise Gitsum. Um, she is the author, among other things, of Politics for People Who Hate Politics. I know many of you are already texting in, like, who is this and how can I find her and how can I follow her around? Denise Grace Gitsum, G-I-T-S-H-A-M dot com. I'm happy to send you the direct link if you want to text me. You guys know the text number, 877-933-2484. Politics for people who hate politics. So that's you and me. How to engage without losing your friends or selling your soul. More with Denise in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Hey, I really like it that you listen whenever you want, wherever you are. At all times of the day and night. That is so cool. So thank you so very much for all the ways in which you support this ministry with your prayers and words of encouragement. Right now, in order for this podcast to be available everywhere all the time for everyone, I actually need your help. Could you support this podcast right now so that more people in more places at every hour of every day could hear about Jesus and grow in their relationship with him? Click the link in the show notes or give now at myfaithradio.com. And thank you so much again for listening to this podcast. If you've grown fatigued um, at the political discourse of the day, you recognize that The way in which we have been engaging um, is broken, and therefore the system itself is broken. And you want to change it from the inside out by engaging in political discourse and in politics in a manner worthy of Christ. That is the message of politics for people who hate politics. There are lessons in here literally on how to engage. Um, And so we want to, Denise, uh, we want to talk with you about some of those spiritual guardrails that you referred to early in our conversation and that you outline for us in the book. Um, so help us, uh, prevent us from veering <laughs> to the left or to the right. Like, right, how do, we, how do we walk the fine line, the narrow path as Christians in the political conversations of the day? I think it's so important to guard our hearts when we engage in politics. That's one of the things I think that that the enemy is able to come in and just co-opt our mind and our hearts and change the way we think about people in a way that isn't honoring because that's what he does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So one of the ways that I'm, one of the ways that I personally am susceptible to having, to being poisoned about what I think of others that I disagree with is through the mainstream media. So often, and I, listen, I say this as a political commentator on a national cable news network. So I'm, <laughs> I try not to be part of the problem. I, well, I this, love is, this is always so funny. No, because I do the same thing. I'm like, okay, yeah. y'all need to not be like listening to folks in the media. And then I'm like, okay, well, maybe accept me. I am yeah. the no, media. it's totally good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> and we're here to help. You know, it's funny. Before I go on, every time I go on, I'm always the Republican commentator. And, and there's always a Democrat on the other side. And before I go on, I always ask the Lord, to use my mouth to speak hope and life and truth into the situation, whether it's a policy issue or it's about an individual. I don't want to just be like everyone else. I want to bring the word of God and I want to be in that love. And I want the people that I disagree with to feel that I love them in spite of our disagreement. And that's actually a really important point I want to make. Sorry, this isn't quite answering your question, but we'll come back. Is that you know, I believe in unity. Scripture has 179 verses on the importance of unity within the body of Christ, but also our efforts to unify with really other Americans. I believe the greatest threat to our country is not something external. It's not China. It's not the Middle East. It's actually how we treat each other and and the fact that we don't love each other well. And so I don't believe, however, unity connotes conformity. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth that unity equals conformity. That's what culture tells us. That's how they try to shame us into saying things we don't believe in. But I do think that it's so important that we cling to unity. And one of the ways that I'm better at that is when I eliminate distractions that cause me to think of the person on the other side of the aisle of me as me as my enemy. And so 
you know your heart, you know the things that rile you up, you know the things that get you mad and pound on tables. I don't know that that's always going to be the most life-giving thing to fill your mind with. And the other thing I think that we have to do is we have to really be quick to establish at the outset of a conversation what our intentions are in engaging in the conversation. If we establish our motives as telling the truth, speaking the truth in love, and building the other person up, and seeking the gold in that other person that we're talking to and disagreeing with, then we have a very different mindset and a heart posture going into the conversation. Sometimes we get in there too fast, right? We're just responding. But I always think it's wise to ask the Holy Spirit to control what comes out of your mouth. It's like I have to every time I go on TV or in any media engagement and really ask the Lord, change my heart. Help me to see what the real issue is. Look, my therapist told me a long time ago that when people are angry, that's only, it's like an iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg, which is only 10% of the iceberg. What's underneath the water, underneath the surface that you can't see is hurt. And underneath that is unmet needs. And guess who's really great at meeting unmet needs? Mm. Jesus. Jesus is great at that. In fact, he's the only one that can speak to our hearts and our identities and the things that we cling to that we think are, you know, do or die. We must win this battle or we're going to just be in deep trouble. No, Jesus says, I've always got you. I've always got you. I've got a plan for your life. I have, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. We all know it. We can recite it from just, just from our verses, from childhood, from Sunday school. And it's true. And so when we bring that spirit into a conversation, when we just know what we're about, we know what we think about the other person, and we can ask the Lord for wisdom into what this person really needs. It's very rarely a confrontation on the issue they're talking about. And that's where we win. Yeah, 100%. I couldn't, I, it'd be impossible for me to agree with you anymore. Like I, I know that's what I feel about you. <laughs> 100%. Um, the, this notion that the battle is, first of all, not mine. It's, it's the battle is already won and it, the victory belongs to Jesus. Like if yes. I could enter into conversations in that spirit um, and that's one of the things that you talk about as well. And I really appreciate that, like not picking up offenses, operating out of, uh, you know, out of the Holy Spirit, not the spirit of the world. Um, just so many good nuggets um, throughout your book. And so I want to, again, it's it's so refreshing. Um, your candor, your fervent belief, um, your ardent heart, your humility, um, your graciousness. I mean, I think everybody listening is like, well, can't we just vote for her? Like, wouldn't that be great? So, um, yeah, Patrice is um, is on our text line right now, and she's like, so good. This is such great news. Mary says, thank you um, so much. Uh, so important to be talking beyond surface appearances or ideas. Yeah, I mean, people are getting it out there. So thank you um, so much for resonating yeah. with, with our hearts today, Denise. Um, let oh. me ask this. As you head out there um, as an ambassador of Christ and in such a high-profile way, can we pray for you? And if so, oh, how? I would be so honored. So listen, I, I, have, I ask everybody to pray for me. Every time I go on TV, every time I do anything public and even in private conversations, I cannot subsist aside from prayer. And so I would love it if y'all would just pray that this message, which is really God's message, um, is something that I live up to in my own life. Listen, I have to pull out my own book sometimes and say, God, I just totally blew it in that conversation. Will you help mm -hmm. to remind me of the things that you've really taught me? So pray for me to have integrity in my life, to actually live out things that God has taught me. I'm responsible for them. Just, just pray for that. And then pray for me to have more love. I find that as we go into an election season, as we go into holidays where we're around a bunch of people that we love so much, but may not agree with, there just tends to be this edge that comes out on all of us, especially in my heart. And so I would be so grateful if y'all could pray for this sinner who just struggles with all of these principles every single day, when she, no matter where she is, because I need God's grace and I need his power as much as anyone else to do the things that he's called me to do. All right, we're going to do that right now. Father God, we come before you as brothers and sisters in Christ um, with our sister, Denise. You know her so well. You love her so deeply. You're using her so um in such important environments and ways. And so, Father, we we come before you, lifting up in the name of Jesus together in one accord that you would answer the prayers that she has already articulated, that she'd be able to live up to the words that you gave her to speak, that she would be a faithful witness, that she would be found to have integrity. 
And that, Father, you would continue to give her more love. In the spirit of Christ, fill her now. Um, Those edges that we all develop toward others. Father, um, just like an emery board, just um, file them off. Continue to refine her. Continue to shine beautifully through her. And Father God, bless her. Guard her heart and her mind. Give her your words to speak and your spirit in which to speak them. In Jesus' name, amen. Carmen, I'm moved to tears. Thank you so much and to your listeners for just blessing me by praying for me this morning. You are absolutely precious. We look forward not only to following you, but catching up with you again. That is uh, Denise Getsum. You can check her out online and all the things she's up to. Denise Grace Getsum. G-I-T-S-H-A-M dot com. I can send you the direct link. Her book is Politics for People Who Hate Politics, How to Engage Without Losing Your Friends or Selling Your Soul. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. And next up, we're going to talk with um, uh, we're going to talk with our buddy Dan DeWitt. And to set that conversation up, um, I want to remind you that folks are really, really struggling, like lots of folks. And maybe you are really struggling today. Um, I was just reading this morning that in 2022, last year, in 2022, just under 50,000 Americans just, I mean, died by suicide. That's a lot of people. That's 3% higher than, um, than 2021. So that means that just in, in two years time, 100,000 of our neighbors took their own life. Like that is astounding. It's the highest rate on record since 1941. Um, maybe, I mean, it, 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 every single one of those people is precious. I am particularly concerned that suicide is on the rise among women over 25 and the highest rate of increase is among people over 75 years old. And so if you're struggling today, if you are in despair, if you are having suicidal thoughts, I want to remind you that, um, All you have to do is text or call 988. That is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, If you're worried about a friend or a loved one, you can also call or text 988 uh, and get some confidential emotional support. For those of you um, who would be interested in passing along a resource, particularly for younger people, I really appreciate the Hope Line You can find them at thehopeline.com. They do a really wonderful job um, talking in real time with those who are struggling, and they do so from a Christian worldview, from a Christian perspective. There is hope. There is hope. Thehopeline.com is a great place to turn as well. Our friend Dan DeWitt has been posting some resources related to, you know, what it looks like to walk in joy, even with tear-stained faces. And so I thought we would talk with him today um, about that as well. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Daniel DeWitt is the director for the Center for Worldview and Culture at Southwest Baptist University. You can read what he is writing at theolatte.com. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Carmen. What's crackalackin? Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I might need a definition of crackalackin. You know what's popping? How's it going? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's, it's just raining. fun, doesn't it? It's, it's raining You need to say it. You need... <laughs> I know. What's crackalackin? There you go. Come on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's good with like cornbread. I feel like crackalackin is a side <laughs> item for like cornbread and like the savory kind, not 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 slathered with honey, but like the yes. savory cornbread, sweet yellow mm-hmm. cornbread mm-hmm. There you that go. you put there in you like go. soup and it just okay. changes the whole dynamic. <laughs> so so just now 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 you have me you know now I'm moving toward the Friday farm report even though I hadn't scheduled to do that at this point in time. <laughs> The question arose uh, on my street, could we grind our extra field corn and and use it as cornmeal? And I confess to you, I don't know. That so, makes sense to me. I would so try those it. Of you, those, I know. So those of you that are out there in the listening world and know the answer to this question, I need some cornmeal development help because I have a lot, a lot of dried 
field corn, more than our cows are going to eat this winter for sure, um, and probably our chickens too. So Jim planted a lot of corn for the deer, and the deer had so many egg corns that they're not eating the corn. So now I have I have a ton of field corn. So let me know out there. Can I grind it up, and can we, you know, can we eat it? Like grits, like polenta, like cornbread for, you know, anyway, I need to know. Inquiring minds. I need to add to that at the old Carmen. Yeah, I'm good. Sorry. Wrong answers only. (laughs) 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 Oh, nice. Okay, good. Oh, all right. Oh, they're rolling in. 877-933-2484. People do know some stuff out there, Daniel. Okay, I, um, you have several posts up right now at theolatte.com that I would like to um, spend some time wandering around in. Joy and sorrow are not mutually exclusive. That is the message of tear-stained joy. So can you talk with us about tear-stained, I mean, the reality of tear-stained joy? Yeah, I, you know, I, I wrote that post as a letter, and I really hoped to, I, I've written a few posts over the last week, just being mindful of as you mentioned before, kind of what we're all going through. I think that sometimes we think that, you know, when we think of mental health struggles that we think someone might have met with a therapist and have some title for what they're dealing with. And so they're kind of, you know, they're dealing with something in a way that we might not be, but the truth is we're all dealing with stuff. And so I wanted to write some things to say, Hey, we're all in this together. Um, But also to maybe offer some encouragement. And I had a, a good friend tell me, recently, like avoid the word fix. Cause sometimes I'll, I'll say that like this fix this or that. And those are the kind of things that are good reminders. And I have to remind myself of. So even in writing this, my hope was to express something from my own soul, but in a way that could be helpful to others. So when it, when it comes to tear stained joy, it has taken me so long to learn that the goal of life can't be just to avoid the tears and seek the joy, um, that they're not mutually exclusive, that they come together, that it's a mixed package. And I think that hoping to seek the one and avoid the other is really the worst kind of thinking because that's not how life is ever going to come to us. And so if you think of the things that bring you joy, your faith, your family, your friends, uh, think about how much of a mixed package all those things are from the doubts with your faith, from disappointments in your faith to man, let's talk about family trauma. Like, you know, that's a real thing. Um, And then even our friends, our best of friends, if you've ever overestimated a friendship, you know how painful that is. But we can't run from all the pain. We have to embrace the the mixed bag of of joy and pain. And as I read through the Psalms, um, I'm reminded that the psalmist is constantly speaking of a tear-stained joy. And I, instead of lamenting that it's not this kind of joy that is free from all sorrow to rather celebrate a tear-stained joy. So that's what that post is about. And I end talking about C.S. Lewis um, spent all of his life writing about joy, half of his life searching for it, the other half talking about how he found it in God. But he talks about in his book, Surprised by Joy, that joy is kind of in our peripheral vision, that when we turn to fix our gaze on it, it eludes us. And I think if that's true, if joy is kind of hidden in that kind of way, um, that it's like seeds that are planted in fertile soil. So although we can't see it, there are flowers and we can walk in the garden. And it's my prayer that even during a hard time that you'll be surprised by joy. Your, um, your post today is about Psalm 34. Um, and it, it reminds us, um, that God will one day, like, right, there's this wipe away every tear, but that implies mm-hmm. tears. Um, that's that Revelation 21 for reference as well. You have me thinking, um, and I want you to actually just read your read your mm-hmm. post today, if you would, um, here in just a moment. But you had me thinking, okay, so um, these families who are receiving back their hostages, that is tear-stained mm-hmm. joy. Um mm-hmm the woman who was released yesterday to only, well, and reunited with her three children from whom she's been separated for these more than 50 days, but only to learn that her husband was killed by Hamas terrorists. Um, Tear-stained joy. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I have a young couple who have been, you know, hoping and trying to get pregnant and how they are responding to the pregnancy announcement of another young couple who they dearly love, but that's tear stain joy. Mm -hmm. Um, just yesterday, a conversation here on air with, um, with an author who like, she just openly acknowledges every time I would get a wedding invitation and I was still single and I didn't understand why. And that was tear stain joy. Childbirth is tear stain joy. Um, just last night, Jim sitting at the dinner table. I mean, he's got a he's got a truck that. I mean, you know, things happen on the farm, right? And so uh, <laughs> something something needs welding. Something big needs rewelding in order that it's going to work again. And that is something that his brother would have done. Like Joe mm. was Jim's mechanic in in the shop in the barn here at our house, and Joe went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago now. And you know, Jim's sitting at the dinner table with tear stained joy, like. Mm. My brother's not here to do the thing that, you know, he, that I really need him to do and that he loved doing and that he was so much better at doing than I am. But I'm, but I also know that, you know, he's with the Lord and he's full of joy mm-hmm. and he's exalting right now. And so, but that's tear stained joy. Um, will you share with us your post today on Psalm 34? I, I would, I would gladly read that. And if I could ask for a favor, dear yeah. Carmen. If you would read the prayer at the end, so I'll read up to the prayer. Is that okay? Yes. Um, So Psalm 34, I I shared a little introduction about, I am a part of a Zoom meeting with some leaders around the world. It's really quite remarkable, an organization called Scholar Leaders. And I'm always so blessed when I get to, to be, meet with them. And yesterday I was asked to read scripture. And so this is the scripture I read for them yesterday. And I thought it went very well with what we're talking about this morning. And then I have included a poem, and then I'll let you read the, the prayer that I wrote out this morning. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I included a short poem by Francis Thompson that I think he's the author of The Hound of Heaven, a great poem that's long. This is short, and I felt like it paired nicely Francis Thompson writes, the poem is Envoy. Go songs, for ended is our brief, sweet play. Go children of swift joy and tardy sorrow. And some are sung, and that was yesterday. And some unsung, and that may be tomorrow. Go forth, and if it be o'er stony way, old joy can lend what newer grief must borrow. And it was sweet, and that was yesterday. And sweet as sweet 
though purchased with sorrow. Go songs and come not back from your far away. And if men ask you why you smile and sorrow, tell them you grieve for your hearts know today. Tell them you smile for your eyes know tomorrow. Dear Father, in our pain, please help us feel your presence, knowing we're never truly alone. In our grief, please surprise us with moments of joy so sadness isn't the only voice we hear. In our doubts, please help our minds to know your love. In our frailty, please protect our hearts from being undone by fear. And in all our days until that day, please remind us there is so much more because you are the giver of life, the author and completer of our salvation. Amen. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. We'll return to our conversation with Daniel DeWitt in just a moment. Feelings, nothing more than feelings. I mean, seriously, if all we had was nothing more than feelings, we would just be lost in a sea of mush. Hello, friend. Uh, I'm sure you have noticed by now that feelings are a terrible barometer of the truth. Our feelings are affected by the weather, world events, what we ate last night, whether or not someone we like or love texted or tagged us in a social post, how badly someone else sings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling lonely right now, I want you to ask yourself, am I really ever truly alone? Of course not. As a follower of Christ, Jesus promises to be with you always. He's literally with you right now in the thick of it, in the midst of whatever circumstances you're dealing with in your life. So I want to be a source of hope and encouragement to you today. If you are struggling to make it, even just to the next moment, if you're feeling lonely, text the word HOPE to 877-933-2484. Our friend Daniel DeWitt posts at theolatte.com. One thing you will find there is surprised by healing. Dan, you talk about um, the reality that Sometimes the healing we need comes from unexpected places. You talk um, joyfully about your introduction to um, one particular product. I'll let you tell the story. Can I just read a little bit of it? Would that be okay? (laughs) Sure. Recognizing that Dan is writing here a bit tongue in cheek. (laughs) Maybe I shouldn't. Oh, shall I? Dare I? Here we go. I came down with a nasty head cold a couple weeks ago while speaking at a conference in Detroit. If you've never given a talk in front of hundreds of people while you're on cold meds, you really don't know what you're missing. While it might sound fun, I can promise you it's not. I, I'm such a middle schooler, Carmen. Mm. So I, I, yeah, I'm just going to skip ahead. I, I got mm. airborne. I was told to get airborne. It took me quite eventually, a while. Eventually, eventually, to- he, eventually he got airborne. <laughs> Yeah. I've, and then know, he didn't know. I've, and then he didn't he didn't read the directions. And so let's just just for just a moment. If you don't read the directions then you don't know that you're supposed to put it in water. And then, Dan, yeah. what happens when you actually well, do follow the directions? If you don't know what airborne is, it's about it's like tablets and they're about the size circumference of a quarter and about as thick as like four quarters. So having not read the directions, because I'm not a nerd. One should um, not chew it up and one should not try to swallow it whole. Yes. Nor should one snort well, yeah. it. So, yeah. Well, that's ahead. what I was thinking because I thought that yeah. would help because that's where the problem is. Fortunately, were. other and... people intervened and told you to put it in water. You're keeping me on track here, Carmen. You're so good <laughs> yes, at that. Yes, I am. <laughs> so when you put it in a cup of water, I freaked out. I had no category. My cup <sighs> started shaking and the water started boiling and it turned like this frothy or it was like you could hear it was loud and then yeah. this little alien climbed out of the orange froth with a shop back and offered to clean out my nose so and that's a true story except for the alien except for the, yeah. yeah except for the alien so um it ended up being really good i'm now addicted to them and um and they're great. You should try them. I think they come in different flavors. I've only tried orange. But the point of my post which I have a couple posts that are kind of more humor than anything, but I I try to make a point at the end. And the point of this one is that sometimes healing doesn't come to us packaged the way we would expect it. Um, And I might add to that, we don't also always know exactly how to receive the healing. Um, 
there's not always directions with those, or maybe we don't read them. And so my hope for anyone listening today would be to be open to healing coming to you from different people that you might not anticipate. And I, I include a paragraph, a, a dear friend of mine, and I share this with with a sense of, of personal pain, because it's a dear friend who went through a dark time, and I wasn't there for them. And so, <clears throat> sorry. So that's part of the story um, that I didn't put in the, in the article, but I'm, I'm giving you here uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, this is, is more convenient, apparently. Um, but they shared that during that time, a dark season in their life, they were really surprised by the people who showed up and it wasn't the people they would expect. And what I would hope for anyone who is kind of in that spot today or has been or, or whatever it is, that you'd be open to being surprised by the people who might help you and that you would receive it um, because we all need to help each other. And I included the verse and I'll just, I'll conclude with this. Um, in second Thessalonians three sixteen, Paul writes, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in all ways, the Lord be with you. I think that um, we all, we have all been the people, we have all been the person who, avoided a friend in the midst of something we we have we recognize that in ourselves and so you're not alone in that i think the acknowledgement of it is really um it, it really important we earlier had um earlier this week we talked with gary miracle and if you don't know his story dan you would appreciate him um and one of the things that he didn't share here on air but several of our listeners picked up on is that after he experienced this incredible life train life changing trauma, um, he he got an infection and it resulted in um, being in an induced coma. And during that period of time, wow. doctors determined he was thirty nine years old. Doctors determined that they needed to remove um, all of his extremities in order for his in order to preserve his life. And so his family mm -hmm. had to make that decision. And so his wife was a part of that. But then subsequently she left him and he didn't share that part of his story here on air. But um, if you could imagine all the help that you would need um, mm -hmm. as a person who no longer has their arms or their legs um, and then the one person in your life who you thought, you know, would be there forever and ever. Like, that's just not something that she that's just not a life that she could wow. live. So um, who walks out and who walks in? Um, really struck me as a part of this mm. particular piece. And so I just, I wanted to thank you for that today um, and clarifying that calling in, in each of our lives that, you know, let's be the mm -hmm. people who, who when called, um, press in and walk in. And then let's also, uh, you know, as people who need help, let's be willing to receive the help God sends in whatever form he sends it. I think that's part of the message here. So sometimes the healing that we need does come from very unexpected places. So thank you yeah. so much for that. That's our friend Daniel DeWitt. You can find him and what we talked about today at theolatte.com. We've got another hour together next. We are going to get an update on what is going on in the Middle East. As I told you yesterday, as I anticipated yesterday, um, the temporary truce between Israel and Hamas has ended um, and what we would call kinetic warfare um, has resumed. And so we are going to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Yes, there will also be a Friday farm report and a conversation with our friend Adam Holtz. So all of that up next. And yes, those of you who've been wondering, Kim Dolan Leto is going to be back as well. Um, have you lost your glow? We're going to talk about how to get it back. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.